So hello everyone, uh, my name is Miller Eskamer, so probably uh, some of you, you know me, but um, uh, some of you don't because uh, I don't know. I'm really happy being again uh, in a geodetic community among you uh, because I have been working on reflectometry. I, I will talk about it more, but uh, today here I am uh, specifically talk about uh, this joint study group AI for GNSS remote sensing, which is going to be chaired by me and Leiliu uh, from University of Colorado. I'm originally, I'm a still, uh, I feel I still belong to GFC, but I'm now on an international visit in, in Barcelona and go to the US. But um, I would like also to thank uh, my, uh, uh, the co-author here, Daishin Zhao, Renda Natras, Benedict Soya, and Jens Vicker. Uh, I'm presenting some of the results from their research here, uh, which, uh, to which uh, also other people have con contributed. So uh, let's start. Um, first of all, we have a keyword. What is uh, Genesis remote sensing. I would like to redefine it. Why? I will save you. So uh, then Genesis of reflectometry, I was thinking deeply, maybe one definition that we can have for it is exploiting Genesis signals to study the properties of the media reflecting the signals uh, through which these signals are propagating. So uh, this is the classical form of Genesis reflect, oh sorry, Genesis remote sensing that you know. Uh, we have a ground-based station and we have the direct signal which passes through the atmosphere, ionosphere, so we can extract the properties of this media. And also we have surface properties here which we can extract. So this is what we know as the geodesies about reflectometry, but it is beyond this. So this is reflectometry and we can call it maybe uh, atmosphere or ionosphere sounding. So, but this is also, we can uh, extend it to a space mode. Actually, we can put our receivers on um, a space platforms. And if you have the direct signals passing through the atmosphere and due to the bending that uh, uh, um, happens, so we have different applications like temperature, specific humidity, and electron density. But uh, which is, honestly, uh, I think is better established in other communities, also it is a geodetic observing uh, uh, technique is a space phone Genesis reflectometry. So what we are doing now is we put the Genesis receiver on a LEO satellite and then, and, and, sorry, here, yeah, and on the LEO satellite and the Genesis signals are reaching the surface, bouncing up from the surface, and in this space we again receive the signals. And depending on which media is reflecting uh, the signals, we can extract a variations, a variety of geophysical parameters like uh, wind speed, ocean surface, land, vegetation, and vegetation state, soil moisture, hydrological uh, uh, parameters, and also we can study glaciers, sea ice, which are directly uh, related to climate change. Um, but uh, now, uh, so I think we have uh, extremely large data sets. So for example, here we see uh, this is a TDS-1, which was actually the, uh, the second demonstration mission of a space phone Genesis reflectometry. But I would like to talk about Cygnus more uh, because it's a NASA mission, which was approved, I think, in 2012 uh, with a budget of $150 million. So it is eight satellites doing reflectometry. And it is uh, the main point of it is it provides us huge data set with an unprecedented sampling rate uh, with a median of uh, three hours, which is not met by other remote sensing satellites easily. So, and then uh, next month, Prati is being launched. Hydrogen SS is a scout mission with a three million budget. So it is going to be launched next year. Uh, so basically we have already enough data from, you know, uh, from these uh, missions, but of course, radio quotation missions are also there, like Cosmic, and we have private sectors doing reflectometry and also radio quotations with numerous satellites like Aspire. We have another American startup which has already started like Moon. And then um, we have ground-based stations. We, have, we already know them. And also there are experiments that people are doing there and uh, you know, in different places. Uh, so like uh, airborne experiments and also other kind of experiments. So we can confirm that we have large data sets which provides us effective learning, which is uh, needed actually for deep learning. So uh, these are just some examples that where it was actually a really good question that where we need to implement AI, not always obviously, but it makes sense, for example, in terms of if you are working with reflectometry, uh, 
I can talk about it better because you know it's a novel domain and the physical models and the theoretical models are not well validated in field conditions. And you know there are different geophysical parameters playing a role here, but incorporating the effects into the measurements is not easily made by the theoretical models. And that's why we can here, for example, implement uh, deep learning, which takes the measurements from Cygnus, which is the delay Doppler map, and then we can convert it to wind speed. I don't go into the details here, but what is the outcome? So this is the deep learning one, and we can be able to provide the global wind speed with an RMSC of 1.36 meters per second. So, and then we compare it to conventional model. We see, you can see here, actually this is a theoretical, let's say it, but it is not pure theoretical, it is a somehow empirical because pure theoretical models is not uh, possible here to be implemented. Uh, but when we see the improvement, so we can see what's going on there. So because deep learning is able to learn the effect of different geophysical parameters empirically. So anyway, let's continue. Uh, also, deep learning is able to provide us a, a, you know, insights on the physics. What's going on? We have now a new trend, explainable models. It is not black boxes. So uh, then, uh, for example, in this case, uh, we have transformers, chat GPT. It is based on also transformers. And then what we can see is we have these uh, attention maps. Where what, what, what were the features that AI is using to predict the geophysical parameter? And we can see, for example, which part of the measurements is important for our model. And then we can check again the theory. What's going on exactly? And this is mutually how we can improve our knowledge and understanding from the measurements and the physics. Okay, uh, this is some of uh, uh, the other examples. So far we talked about retrieving geophysical parameters, but we can also do air system modeling, like forecasting. So this is the case, for example, is done for uh, VTEC uh, forecasting in different scenarios, quiet period and some period. It is um, a, a study uh, by, uh, led by Randall Netras. So here we can, there are some, uh, I think it's a, it is a really recent one, and she said me that it is, going to be published soon, it is accepted. So, and then probably you can go for, to, for, to, uh, for more details to this study, but it is really prom shows promising results that we have a good, uh, you know, consistency uh, between the, uh, the ground truths and the pre uh, uh, ML predicted ones. But uh, the, the, I would like to highlight that what is also important is the uncertainty. So um, we, we, we as geodesists are really interested in uncertainty, and then probably here, Again, machine learning can provide us uncertainty, of course. So, and then the other one is the, the done by in Colorado. So here you can see different deep learning architectures are implemented to show the dynamics of the ionosphere and it's forecasting the state of the ionosphere for us. Anyway, and uh, but within this uh, join the study group, we are. Uh, focus on three, uh, sorry, four main objectives. First of all, retrieving high-quality geophysical parameters, and which can be uh, followed by uncertainty quantification, so which is important for us. And also, uh, physical inform informed AI. I showed you one example. Uh, we can incorporate our physical knowledge to the to the training stage, and also mutually learn about the AI models. What's missing in our knowledge? What, what, what are they are taking the advantage in our measurements to have a better predictions? And in the end, we have the, uh, can, we can do air system modeling, <clears throat> prediction forecasting of the surface, atmosphere, and ionosphere, and climate derived changes. And in the end, as I said, so it can uh, lead to support risk assessment, early warning systems, and decision making for climate change mitigation and adaptation. So uh, the good point is that the study group is already established. I'm really surprised. We received many uh, interests uh, from different countries, which I'm uh, trying to show you by, by the size of the countries here. Uh, it's, a, it's going to be a large group, but hopefully also uh, uh, fruitful. And we are covering uh, diverse uh, members. I mean, not only in terms of the nationality, but also in terms of career age. 
most of them are young, but we have also senior scientists here. And I'm really happy that we can together make an improvement. So finally, yeah, AI4G and SS Remote Sensing Launch. Thank you for your attention. And here are just references to the studies that I showed you. Yeah, thank you again. Thank you very much, Midat. Are there any questions? Yep. Perhaps, well, thank you very much. Perhaps my question is premature uh, because perhaps it will be covered by the other presentations, but could you uh, formulate briefly um, what the area of remote sensing makes why remote sensing is attractive for a machine learning application. What is, are the ingredients why uh, uh, you focus machine learning on GNSS remote sensing? Is it the uh, availability of the large data sets that, for training or are there ele other elements in play as well? Uh, the, I, I can tell you my experience actually. So uh, thank you very much for this question. It is a really important question because we face sometimes publications which is not necessary, for example, uh, applying you know, machine learning. But we know that, but because it's a hot trend, everybody is interested to discover and explore it. But the elements, for example, in my field, let's talk about reflectometry because we, we, we are running currently a project AI for uh, Genesis reflectometry at GFZ. Uh, the point is, First of all, uh, if you want to go through traditional methods, we need a good physical model. Uh, this physical model, we know that as a physicist, when we want to develop a theory, we are based on simplifying assumptions. So for example, we say that, okay, this is the first condition, this is the second condition, and these conditions, this formula is valid. Uh, but it is not real, in, in, maybe sometimes in real environment it doesn't work because you know, the, environment, the interactions are really complicated. For example, reflectometry, we have ref, uh, you know, uh, signal reflections from the ocean surface. And I was trying hard to say, uh, you know, I had a hard time you know, to, convince the society, uh, to convince the community that yeah, uh, rain also plays a role here because rain is splash changes the surface and reflection patterns. Then rain comes here, but honestly, I didn't see any, you know, explicit model to, you know, teach, show us the effect. But now we can do it with machine learning. Empirically, let's learn it. Let's see from the data. We have large data sets to be fed into the models, and then they can learn and provide us the relationship. How, what's, what's, what's the interaction of these several parameters? And I think this is the most important point, I think, that, uh, that, that we can uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, the main advantage of using AI, probably. Okay, thank you.